I mean, there are a lot of places we could go and start and talk about, you know, how this film came into existence, and I would like to to hear that. Um, but let's start with Attorney General Donovan, sort of. Uh, commenting on what you've seen and, and how it relates to your own work and whether or not there's anybody in Vermont who suffers from mental illness and <laughs> <laughs> according to your statistics. <laughs> well, thank you for that softball. <laughs> First of all, Jennifer, that, congratulations. This was a remarkable piece of work. And, um, I, I think my first reaction sitting there was, every law enforcement official and officer in the state of Vermont in this country needs to see this. Uh, because... <laughs> because what you showed us was not law enforcement, how it's being practiced, but how it should be practiced. And the, the one scene that I think epitomized that for me was when Kendra was on the bridge and Ernie sat down. Right. Yeah. I don't know if people caught that. Sat down and turned his back. Yeah. And you talk about de-escalation and you talk about, and, the, and just the language about trust um, and the hands, be, be, that is contrary to what I think everybody's taught and that, that's the issue. And in that same scene, Kendra is kind of voicing the fear and concern of anybody who's in a community that doesn't trust police. Right. Um, and Ernie and Joe would say the number one th tool that they have is usually not being in uniform, but that was a perfect example of it working even in uniforms. Because they were in uniform there, which actually made it more difficult probably. Definitely, and, uh, and so when I, but then, then the more I thought about it, I said, it, you know, it's an example of, it's an illustration of it working even in uniform. Right. And every single call, I went on hundreds and hundreds of calls with them, and the common denominator was, you're not in trouble, yeah. my name is Ernie, my name is Joe, finding out their first name right off the bat. So they had these certain things they do that just immediately just bring the temperature down. You know, the other, the other scene that for me was incredibly powerful, uh, I think Joe was talking to a group of first responders and he was talking about the scenario where a woman was suicidal and had the gun. And he was right. What do you hear? You don't hear suicidal, you hear gun. And you, and you hear how people then, to use their term, get amped up and get ready. And, you know, we talked about this earlier. Um, what we should be talking about, what this film for me is going to spark a discussion which needs to happen in Vermont and across this country is officer involved shootings because it's a threat of mental illness because what he was talking about is exactly the issue. They, they hear gun and that changes the scenario from a mental health crisis uh, to a public safety I issue. Exactly, and I think we're doing the police a disservice across the country because we're sending them, they are the de facto first responder, they're not mental health professionals, but who do you call? You don't call a psychiatrist, you call 911. So we're sending them into these situations completely ill-prepared and then expecting a, a decent outcome. So, you know, they're, they're, they're being, Joe would say, if Joe were here, he'd say, we're given a huge inoculation of paranoia in the police academy and we need to, you know, we talk about the numbers, 60 hours on how to use your handgun, eight on how to communicate and talk about mental health. So we've got it a little backwards. Well, and I love the fact, I, I, I don't know if it was Ernie or Joe, they said, we're not clinicians, you know. And again, getting back to our earlier conversation, just the, the, the empathy that they demonstrated. And I guess my question would be, can you teach empathy? Can you teach this because, or is this such a personality driven role for those officers, um, and that's, that's one of the things that I, I question. Yeah, and there is some debate on that, because um, the original model was not to, um, San Antonio is the exception, they train 100% of their officers, because they feel like they'd rather have everybody have it, but definitely some people are better than others um, at doing it, and I think that the thing is, if a police department decides to have a standalone mental health unit, which is, that's all they do. So they become the experts. So if a patrolman is feeling out of his element, they call these guys in. So there's this idea of, you know, I think the more you do it, the more comfortable you are with it as well. 
you know, the other, the, the other thing that was remarkable to me, um, and, it, and it was true, 90%, and I think if you talk to any law enforcement officer in Vermont, they'd say most of the calls they respond to are mental health calls. But what, what was different here was, I didn't see one scene where they brought somebody to jail or to court. I, I didn't see that, and that, the, the de facto mental health facilities are our prisons because you have police officers respond, as you say, as mental health clinicians, although we don't train them as such, and there's get, something has to happen. There's gotta be an action step, and the action step is either jail or court, and court's gonna be a jail cell after you have the court hearing. I didn't see that here, which was remarkable. And it is, and that's why I filmed in San Antonio, because they're doing it better than anyone else, because they realize it's collaboration. You can't just train officers. You have to be talking to the mental health community on how to do it properly. I mean, there are two largest mental health facilities in this country are the LA County Jail and the Cook County Jail in Chicago. That is just criminal. Yeah, excuse yeah. the bad pun. Yeah, yeah and so um, it seems like in San Antonio that at least it's, it's getting better in terms of that coordination, that it, well, that it was not perfect there, certainly, but that it was better and that it's essential, and that without that connection, so the mental health clini clinics are expecting fully, and that you have mental health clinics. I don't think in Vermont we have a lot of mental health clinics uh, that certainly, I mean, if you go to the Northeast Kingdom, or, you know, I mean, you know, um, which would also help to destigmatize this question of mental illness. I mean, we've spent time in Vermont over the last few years destigmatizing opioid addiction, for example, okay, and that's had a positive effect and has led to more rehabilitation and coming out into the open. Destigmatizing mental health is hugely important. Absolutely. And in some ways, you know, when you talk about empathy, looking at Joe and just sort of analyzing this guy. I mean, here's a guy where freedom's just another th word for nothing left to lose is what describes him. I mean, he's sort of completely bottomed out and has sort of rebuilt himself also by admitting his fear that he talks to the other policemen about. And that's probably a necessary step to establishing empathy and generosity. An extremely generous guy. No, very, and they were generous subjects. I mean, I was following them for a solid two and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, they were wonderful, but I just wanted to make one comment about this idea of collaboration, is um, that San Antonio is thinking strategically moving forward. So they're not sitting on their laurels. They're figuring out what doesn't work. They, they have something called the Navigator now, which is gonna be in every police car that tells you where there's an empty bed. Is that bed set up for children? Is that, I mean, they're really, so they're not, and they know they're not perfect. I mean, they still have problems, but they're really rolling up their sleeves. And I think the reason is, is that once a month, the cops sit down with the uh, civic stakeholders and the mental health community and judges and everybody who runs a city, they sit around, they call it a medical round table, and the hospitals, private and public, they sit down, they roll up their sleeves, and they duke it out to figure out, because they've realized it's, it's a community problem. It's not a law enforcement problem. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And I, just sitting here, the, the, the other scene I just want to re remark on was the, the oh, no, I love it, it was great. The juxtaposition of the opening scene yeah. with the screwdriver and the, the officer involved shooting exactly. to in the courtroom with the pen. Yeah. And I think it was Joe, very, very just, again, just no big deal, can you just leave the pen? Yeah. And de-escalated, walked out, helped him. No, and that's why it's the opening scene. Because, because the pen, the pen it, would be viewed as a weapon. It, that, it, that's the weapon. That's it, oh, the definitely. The screwdriver was the weapon in, in, no, in the yeah. opening. And Ernie and Joe told me that multiple times, that anything, they're trained that anything can be a weapon. I mean, there was a shooting in um, Oklahoma with someone with a rake. Like, it's just how they're trained. Anything can be a weapon. And so I think um, instead of polarizing ourselves from law enforcement, we need to train them better and la allow them to protect and serve which is the reason they're in their jobs. You know, the other, the other thing about letting the police do their job was th these guys had, I thought, a lot of discretion. And that was different, too, because a lot of times when the police arrive, there's got to be that action step, and the action step is put them back in the cruiser, they're going to go to court, and there's going to have that process, and almost that conveyor belt mentality of the justice system, which is part of the problem. Uh, but 
Ernie and Joe, and perhaps the entire unit, were invested with remarkable discretion. That's a testament to leadership of the police department. Definitely, and the thing is, and they will say it again and again, that they, what they have that regular patrolmen don't have is time. Yeah. So as Joe says in that opening scene, if it takes an hour, it takes a half hour, we'll say, they'll just wait it out. Um, and they understand that time is their friend. And in a typical 911 patrol situation, it's like we've got to kind of close this and get to the next one. So that has to do, and every, every police department in the country is understaffed. So it's a huge problem, you know, we have to, it's, it's, a, it's a big job, but I think they're right, this is the future of policing. We just have Absolutely. to, we all have to jump on board. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, the conversations that we've had in Vermont is, and you, you raised this point, do we want the police uh, to be our, our first responders or our mental health crisis workers. And I'm not sure it's an either or because the reality is when, when something bad happens, the police are called. And so the question is who are we gonna train and what is the better approach? And that approach, and we had this conversation earlier about de-escalation. That was de-escalation. De-escalation isn't going in with a taser. I mean, I think you saw one shot of a taser there um, and de-escalation isn't going in with uh, the, the shield and all these other uh, less than lethal, as they say, um, weapons. And that's how we're framing de-escalation right now in law enforcement. And I think that's the problem. What you saw was empathy, right. compassion, and true de-escalation and, and truly seeing people as a flawed human being as we all are. And you can't train young people in a police academy setting to think they're going to graduate and be dealing with bank robbers yep. when really 80 to 90 percent of the calls they're dealing with are someone in emotional distress. So we're, both, we're putting both sides at a huge disservice. Yep. Yeah, now it seems like San, San Antonio also, at least initially, established who its mental health officers were going to be. And they said, you know, the, the regular calls, the rest of the department can take care of, we're going to focus on those, which means we have the discretion to deal with it as needed and take the time that's needed. Whereas regular police are aware of the fact this is the number of calls we're getting each night. They, get, they need to get this done, get it closed, move on to the next thing. But Joe says, you know, as he mentions in the film, they're only reaching 5 to 10 percent of the calls. Right. Like they're not right. there of the mental health calls. Right. right. But they've trained the dispatchers so that it actually comes up as a call for mental health. So it's just it's a huge kind of mm -hmm. system approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has seemed to me, and I may be wrong, but just recent news reports in the state of Vermont over the last year, it seemed to me there are more tense situations that are happening Absolutely. right now. Yeah. I mean I think there has been an, I know there's been an increase in officer involved shootings. Um, in this state and in this nation. Uh, and let's be clear, every single one of them, mental health is an issue. Uh, and how we respond to it, how we train on it. Uh, there was a recent article, I think, in Vermont Digger about whether or not you change the legal standard. I'm not sure the legal standard is the issue, it's how we respond. And when you respond with force, um, look, I go back to what Joe was saying. Woman with a gun who's suicidal, you hear gun, and you respond with guns. That, and there's been a lot in Vermont that's happened, and I can name them here, um, that, um, that they're terrible. And, you know, I also want to say, you did a great job talking about the issue of mental health and the police responding. You also did a tremendous job talking about the toll of the job and the mental health on the officers. And I want to really just acknowledge that too, because that's, it is a tough job. Yeah, and I think because we're so secretive about mental health and it is such a stigma and it's very much a stigma, uh, they're afraid they're gonna lose their job, so they don't. Uh, and that was, has been a really interesting byproduct of this unit for San Antonio, is that it was created for the community, but what they have found is a lot more people coming to them confidentially, spouses, officers. Um, because when I was filming, there were four suicides on the police department while I was there. And he, we talk about it. They, I mean, they're more likely to die at their own hand than in the line of duty. So there's a huge trauma issue in law enforcement. 
that we're also not talking about. So we're sending people into difficult situations and they're not having their own mental health needs. You know, it's, right. it's a complicated issue mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that if we're sending people out with weapons to protect us, they need to also feel secure and safe in their own mental health. So. And to that extent, I think the film performs an important service because it sort of holds up a model for progressive policing in, a, in an environment where, you know, because part of the polarization in America over the past period of time has also been included polarization around the police. Okay. And it hasn't led to anything constructive. And police need to know, A, that there is this model which is exemplary, that B, there is empathy for their own stresses and the, and the difficulties of the job, and C, there are heroic police operating in the public interest with huge compassion and frankly courage you know to go into situations yeah. and and because in you know what if kendra had had a gun or a knife or you know or had jumped you know exactly which, if they which, had jumped they the trauma yeah. itself and the thing is that you know they're doing it in texas <laughs> if they can do it in texas they can freaking do it in vermont yeah. <laughs> So, uh, I think there are probably some questions in the audience. Before we go to them, I just one quick thing, just briefly, what led you to the project in terms of, uh, you know, this was a, pa a passion that Definitely. consumed you for some number of years, so. Yeah, my last film, um, I followed five women in a maximum security prison. It was called Mothers of Bedford. Um, and it was a film about parenting and mothering and how, you know, incarceration in general. Uh, but what struck me during the research and filming of that uh, documentary was how many uh, untreated mentally ill people are sitting in our jails and I was it was heartbreaking for me to see that at the, this woman's prison and that wasn't what my film was about so I wasn't really able to tackle it um, but it always was kind of rattling in the back of my mind that this was just so wrong and it just seems hard once somebody's in the system you cannot they are not getting mental health treatment in any meaningful way um, and so when this work came to light to me I really felt compelled I mean it felt like a dovetail to my last film um, and then when I met went out I, I sat I drove with them for a week without a camera which was the smartest thing I would tell any filmmaker to do, is to not show up with your camera at first. Because if you really, filmmaking, this kind of filmmaking is about trust. They need to know that you're there to kind of tell their authentic story, not your own. And so by spending that time without the camera, I was able to really say, this, they're the real deal. Like, and they were just so funny. Um, the whole thing could have been a comedy if I had not been careful, because there was one. <laughs> Like, watching them try to order chai tea at Starbucks was, like, hilarious. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, but so, so then you realize you've got amazing characters that can help you tell a complicated story. And so that's it. Uh, cool. Well, just excellent, excellent work. And uh, so any questions from the audience? Uh, right here. I do. Uh, my name's Rachel, and I used to be a reporter in Rockford, Illinois, just north of uh, Chicago. And at the time, w one of the... Uh, reforms that were happening was the drug courts and so they sort of emerged and then they were defunded and w what I'd like to know from both of you is whether or not you're seeing um, obviously there's an interest for this but we know that mental health institutions were closed defunded over several decades some contend that it's 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 a path to uh, spend money toward more prisons and I'd like to know, what's the context of the, of the private prisons, uh, prison industry and its impact on, on the efforts to duplicate what they're doing in San Antonio? San Antonio. Is there pressure against um, addressing mental health issues as opposed to just filling the prisons and building more? Right. Well, yeah. I have so to the question, is there pressure um, against uh, dealing with mental health issues, particularly given the growth of the private prison industry. Yeah, I think, you know, in, I can speak to San Antonio specifically because they, when, before I made the film, they were planning to build a new jail. So Gilbert, the head of the he Mental Health Authority, who's interviewed briefly there, talks about the jails were all overcrowded, it was a mess, and the state was threatening to come in and take over because it was so bad. And the plan was to build a bigger jail. That was the original plan. 
And luckily, they hired Gilbert to kind of come in and do an assessment. And he looked at who was actually sitting in jail and said, half of these people are mentally ill. Like, why are they? And so once they actually made a commitment, you know, you need that will of the city to say, you know, why are these people there? Once they started shifting, and it took a couple of years for them to kind of address it properly. Once they realized it, they did not need to build a new jail because half the people were now in, not in it. And what they did was they took the funds, uh, the bonds from the city and built a 24 hour mental health treatment center for the cops to bring them to, which has a detox and everything. So, and, so it solves, that's what I mean about long-term strategic thinking. You need a lot of smart people sitting down and working together because if you train cops and then there's nowhere for them to take them, but an overcrowded ER, What's good? So this has allowed the police officers to drop the patient and be back in their patrol car in 15 minutes. So, just a quick follow-up. I mean, I know in Vermont there's pressure to send prisoners to other states. So c can you talk a little bit about what kind of pressure your office is getting? Um, sure. I think the first thing we should do is hire Mr. Gilbert and bring him to Vermont. Uh, uh, we. You know, the first part of your question, we do have drug courts and we also have mental health courts. And I know San Antonio, I think, has a municipal mental health court. Great programs, totally support them. I always view the criminal justice system as this, that on the highway to a jail, it should, you should have exit ramps based on risk and based on need the whole way up. Which really means empowering investing in officers on the front end to make those decisions in the community so you never get in the system. Once you get in the system, frankly, it's hard to get out. And so you have this, and we've done a lot of work in terms of alternatives and, and diversions. The fact of the matter is we do send 200 Vermonters out of state uh, to a privately run prison, uh, which I oppose. There's also talk in this state about building a really big prison, which I oppose. And here's the thing about the economics of jail or prisons. If you build it, you have to fill it. Period. So when you talk about building a big jail with beds, you have to fill those beds. That's how the economics of prisons work, and that's why we have to continually beat the drum about not building new jails, but investing in community uh, mental health and community health, period. And making sure the officers can make those decisions. Jen, Jen just said a critical piece here. It was the building of the 24-hour kind of step-down facility because right. They got to go somewhere because what underlies this, you saw it a little bit, Jay, you got to this question a little bit, is liability. And you have to talk about that. Right. There's got to be a decision made in the community about what you're going to do. And the default position, and this has been the problem with why we have mass incarceration, is the default system, because of the defunding of the community mental health system, has been jail. Yeah. That, that's the default position. And that's the easiest decision any prosecutor can police officer can make because it requires absolutely no courage. I'm gonna put you in jail, then I don't have to make a decision. Uh, so it's the investment. Definitely, and I, but I think this style of policing also does something else that's really, really important, which is repair the damaged relationships between police and the communities that they work in. And we, you know, we had, I, this was at um, AFI uh, documentary series in, um, down in DC, and we had a, a panel discussion talk back with a, um, adv um, an activist from Ferguson um, it was sitting with us and Ernie and Joe. And you could tell everybody in the audience was like, shit, like, this is, it's either gonna go really well or really not well. And it went beautifully because it was a chance for a really honest conversation. Um, and I think that's where we, and he, he was, was very honest, this young man said, I didn't wanna watch this film. Like what do two white cops in Texas have to tell me? And he watched it and was very moved. And now they're, they're actually planning to kind of visit each other. I think Ernie and Joe are going to go to Ferguson. But um, be, and so that's important to me, that we need to start talking. This film is about mental health, and it's about policing. But it's really about human connection. And we've lost that in a lot of ways in this country. And we, I think we need to get back to this idea of taking care of each other from as a human being to a human being, which is sounding too corny. I'm just going to share a quick story. During the Ferguson up, uprising upheaval, <clears throat> I actually called the Ferguson uh, Police Department out of nowhere and I asked them uh, what the lowest cost parking ticket cost in Ferguson and it was $125. And I asked what happened if you did not pay the ticket and they said in 10 days there would be a bench warrant for your arrest. It's a 
astounding. And this was part of the issue that was operating in Ferguson, is that basically the whole population was being yeah. criminalized. And so it just became war, really, at some level. It was terrible. Um, yes? I just want to get a sense of your sense of how this model, I want to get a sense of, of your sense of how this model is being accepted or rejected by police departments nationally. Is this something that is, has any chance of catching on? It makes so much sense to me. Yeah, no, I think it does, but it's like any good idea, very slow going. I'd say 20% um, do some kind of training, which isn't great. Um, and I would say even less than that, do it the way San Antonio does it. So I think it's slow, but I do think it is catching on, to be honest. I, I do believe that. But I, I think, I'm hoping this film, I mean, that's a big reason why I made it, which is that I want it to be a conversation starter. And I don't want it to be, I didn't want it to be a preachy, scolding, this is how you should make your city or town better. I want people, I wanted people to be kind of on this ride with these two and feel like, wait a minute, like let's look at our own community and see where we are, what our resources are. I mean, we were at South by Southwest and some, uh, somebody stood up from rural Minnesota and said they have one sheriff in their town and their number one issue is mental health. So, I mean, it's across the board. And so I'm hoping this can just get people inspired to figure something out that's better than what we have now. I have no comment for our current president. <laughs> In the back, um, with the red shirt, yes. It clearly was very intrusive. I mean, it would potentially be very intrusive. No, that was actually really important to me. Was to, I really tried to be as unobtrusive because to have me noticeably there would have ruined exactly what they're so good at. So I, I definitely kept a very safe distance at all times. As did my cameraman was like a pretzel in the back of the police car. So we, we tried to really not make ourselves part of the problem. No, I think that one of the real skills in documentary filmmaking is to be a fly on the wall, to, to be so trusted that your presence does not impact what happens. Uh, and I think that that was you know, certainly a sign of that. I, let's Jay, up here? I think up here? probably what? Up here, Jay? Two more questions. Let's go up here. Up, up here, we'll come back here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I love this film, and if we wanted to bring it to a local police station, yeah. how do we do that? There's actually going to be a woman named Jen Stamps who uh, will take your email. <laughs> She'll take your email at the end because I actually just am looking to get grant money and working, we're working on an outreach grassroots strategy for sure because that's my number one goal. So please, or go to our website and, and you can sign up for our, our newsletter. And we're very responsive to emails too for outreach. Yeah, right here there's a question. Yeah. Lloyd has a microphone if you'd like it. He's, he's coming down. I can just shout it if you like. Okay. Not a fast one. Thank you. Um, I, I am just really curious on your thoughts about the race aspect of this film. Like, what, what processes are you going through to make sure that you're representing people of different races? properly and yeah if you could just speak to that yeah well there are 300 hours of footage and as you may have well several people there were people of both races that they were helping um, and I think when you do this kind of training and this is what kind of came out in the Ferguson discussion was that if you stop training cops to only look at behavior and instead look at what's happening underneath and it changes their view and I think another common denominator with this type of training is that the officers themselves become better officers. So I would argue I didn't see any, I followed them for 300 hours and didn't see anything that I thought was um, racially motivated in terms of how they were doing it. And I think it's probably because of the style of policing they're doing. So that's the best I can yeah, argue. The, their interaction with Kendra is entirely... And Keith in the courthouse. I mean, I've had multiple um, 
young African-American men come up to us at screen and saying, as soon as he saw Joe do the fist pump, they, they felt a whole different sense of um, the fact of how they were seeing the person internally as, a, as opposed to anything else, so. One more question. Who, who would like to ask the last question? Who is really somebody with two hands up in the air? That's yeah. definitely a qualifying. <laughs> Law enforcement officers could see this film. Is there a way that you can make that happen here in Vermont? Yes, there is. We're going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, thank you so much, uh, T.J. Donovan. Thank you so much, Jen, for a fabulous film, a cathartic film, really, in terms of its power and its its craft as well. I mean, it's it's beautifully shaped. It flows. We become deeply involved with everybody that is on screen and it's extraordinary work. Thank you to everybody who has made this festival a success. Thank you.